how to prove correctness and crash safety over replicated disk. So what we're going to do is uh, finish up the discussion about handling concurrent failures from yesterday, where we were worried about one of the two disks failing uh, and leaving us in an inconsistent state or losing data. And we'll finish that discussion, look at the code for the homework assignment we have you guys do, and uh, look at the proof structure we use for these kinds of proofs and how we prove them correct. And then the second half, uh, Franz is going to dive into the actual crash safety of this whole sequence of crash safety lectures. Uh, and we'll look at how we model crashes and how we deal with the computer rebooting and recovering and so on. So to start with, uh, what I want to first explain to you guys is a proof approach that we use uh, that's different from what you, uh, you were doing in the homework assignments uh, on the first day. Um, and this is going to be uh, using a, uh, effectively a form of whore logic or pre and post conditions. Uh, so one thing I should ask is, uh, have you guys covered whore logic in some form or another already in this uh, summer school? No? Yeah. All right. Yes? No? OK. Well, I guess there's disagreement. Uh, so I'll cover it again. Uh, <laughs> so um, the proof structure you saw previously um, had to do with uh, simulation relations. So we had. Uh, to see, to draw you guys this diagram that you must be getting very familiar with. We have our code states running through at the bottom, uh, and we're going to have our spec states at the top that restate our um, state in terms of a more abstract uh, state type, and we prove that stepping the implementation through the code ends up in a spec state that corresponds to the final outcome if you start from a spec state that corresponds to the initial outcome. And this is the kind of proof you guys were doing for the StatDB example that we had you working on, the bad sector remapping, and so on. And it turns out this is a fine plan, but uh, a little uh, more flexible plan that we're going to use for dealing with concurrency uh, is whore logic, which deals with pre and post conditions. So it's a little bit more flexible in a way that hopefully you'll see in a second. So the difference between these plans is that instead of sort of jumping all the way to the spec state at the very top right away, what we're going to do is uh, have theorems uh, that talk about what was true before running a program and what must be true after. So here we're going to have our arbitrary code states. Um, and we'll have some program that runs, maybe multiple states in the middle. Um, here's our procedure. And we'll end up in a final code state. And instead of correlating these code states to spec states right away, what we're going to do is just write some sort of a precondition that must be true in this initial state. And then we're going to prove that if you started from a code state that satisfied this precondition and you run this procedure, you're going to end up in a state that satisfies some kind of post condition. Hopefully, it makes sense. This is a slightly abstract. Uh, but uh, here's maybe an example of this. So if we had a precondition, uh, this is sort of a little bit detached from our uh, disk example, but if you had a precondition that you had a variable x whose value was 5, you could totally prove a postcondition that if you run the program x equals x plus 1, that your postcondition is x equals 6. Very concrete pair of pre- and postconditions. And the reason this is going to be more flexible is that um, at the top level, we're going to use this pre-post condition machinery to state pre and post conditions that exactly match up with our specification layer. So the top level theorem for us that we want to prove is, of course, this correspondence between code and spec. And we're going to restate it as a top level theorem in terms of pre and post conditions, where the precondition says the code state matches the spec state. And the post condition that we're going to be required to prove is that the final state after running this entire procedure is going to match this post condition, which is exactly saying that the code state matches the final spec state. So at some level, at the top level, they're going to be equivalent. The cool thing is that uh, this is going to allow us to decompose the proof of this top level statement into smaller statements that will be more manageable and more automatable to prove. So in particular, the automation machinery or the proof approach that we're going to be seeing is going to be considering the procedure in question uh, by breaking it up uh, across basically semicolons. 
So breaking up a long procedure that is a sequence of statements into the smaller procedures that, co that it's composed from. So to give you a little bit of a sense of what this might look like, uh, suppose that we have a program or a procedure that is, you know, concatenation of A, then B, then C. So this might be read a disk sector, write a different disk sector, and write a third disk sector. So how do we prove a theorem like that about the execution of all these A, B, C steps? So at the code level, what this is going to look like is that we have an initial code state. We run the A. We get another code state. Then we take the B, get another code state, run the C, get a final code state. And we have this slightly imposing theorem that we have to prove that we have a precondition that must be true about this state. And we now have to prove that we'll end up in a postcondition being true about the final state. So you guys on board with sort of what we need to prove, at least? Make sense? Any questions? OK. So the way we're going to decompose this somewhat uh, complicated proof is to say, well, let's consider the first semicolon. So we'll say the program will we'll first run A and then worry about the rest later. And what we're going to do is we're going to find a similar kind of a statement about the correctness of just A in terms of pre and post conditions. So we're going to formalize this all in Coq. I'll show you guys later. But basically, what we can do in Coq or even in sort of informally on a board is to talk about being able to prove the correctness statement of a program. We're going to be calling this prog spec. The program spe satisfies a specification. And this will basically be a statement in Coq, as you'll see later too, that basically says, here's a precondition. And here's the procedure you want to run. And here's a post condition. So when I was talking about up here proving the end-to-end -end correctness of a program, it was saying, well, you have to prove something like the prog spec with this precondition running this full procedure satisfies this post condition. That's what we're sort of talking about now, proving the pre-ABC post specification correctness. And what we're going to do is say, well, let's find ourselves uh, a specification of just the first piece. So this whole thing here. Uh, from this pre to post is going to be prog spec of some precondition of A, B, C with the post condition. And we're going to ask the developer or someone, some proof automation, to find us a prog spec of just the A part with something of A with some post condition. And what this means is that uh, we can imagine there's some other precondition pre prime that uh, you know might be true about this state and if and the already known specification for a says if this other precondition is true and you run a then some other post condition will be true here so this might be a lemma that you separately prove about the little piece a and the way you can use it to build up this larger proof now is to say well Maybe I can prove that the precondition of my big theorem implies the little precondition of just the A piece. And if that's true, I can run the A. I will know that this little circle will satisfy this post condition. And I can think of this guy as basically the precondition for the rest of the program. So the way I'm going to prove the prog spec of the entire sequence is to chain up the prog spec of little a prove that this precondition implies this guy, and then require that the programmer now prove the prog spec of B semicolon C. The post condition stays the same. What's the new precondition for this B semicolon C? Yeah, so we're basically sort of chaining up these pre and post conditions, and we can decompose this even further. So if we find another little prog spec for B, it's going to have its own pre double prime, apologies for the Cox style opaque variable names. Um, and we're going to find another little prog spec for B with these pre and post conditions. We'll prove that there's implication of these predicates on states. And then we'll move on and we'll say, well, OK, now we just have to find the prog spec for this little C piece. 
and you can keep pushing this all the way to the end, and you boil down reasoning about the execution to just sort of implications about these descriptions of states all along, and at the very end, you'll have some sort of a post condition, you know, many primes. You just have to prove that it implies the final post condition. So this is a fairly convenient, in many cases, approach for, cons for decomposing these proofs about big programs into proofs of smaller programs. One sort of downside is that you have to be fairly uh, meticulous about writing these specs or uh, proofs about the correctness of little pieces too, but this turns out to be not that big of a deal in practice for many cases. Make sense? Okay, so in order to automate this stuff, we basically, there's really two requirements. You have to be able to find these little pieces somewhere, and you have to hopefully automate this kind of implication uh, from preconditions of the big theorem to the preconditions of the little piece that you found. And if that works out well, um, you're probably in good shape in terms of um, automating quite a bit of this proof. So that's the sort of high level, board level view of the proof machinery I'm gonna be using here. Um, now we're gonna dive into the cock code uh, for implementing this. I guess I should pull down the screen, and it takes a while. Um, but um, one thing I wanna remind you of is sort of the picture. We're gonna look at a particular cock implementation from yesterday, uh, but uh, in case you've forgotten or weren't around yesterday, I'll remind you what the sort of general uh, plan is for us there. Let's see how much I can keep here. Um, so the general plan is we're replicating two disks and uh, we're gonna have two, you can sort of think of them as two logical disks, each of which is an array of blocks. And the plan for us to achieve some sort of fault tolerance from concurrent disk failures is to write the same data to both of the disks. So we're gonna run, you know, if we write to sector three, some value X, we're gonna put the X here, and we're also gonna put the X on the other disk. Make sense? So let's look at the code, I guess, and uh, we'll sort of see what uh, the code is doing with these replicated disks and uh, why it's important. So here's my cock ID. For now, let's just look at the code. So here's the code for reading from a replicated disk. Um, hopefully this makes some sense. We're gonna read from the first disk. If that seems to be working, we're good. We can just use that value. If, we read the, if the first disk failed, we read from the other disk. And if that works, we're also in business. Otherwise, just return some zero block. And during the proof, as I mentioned yesterday, we're going to prove that this is an impossible situation. You don't have to consider it within our failure model. Any questions? Yeah. So, like, here you have to write code also for uh, cases that won't happen given your preconditions. Uh-huh. But, I mean, in general, maybe there are lots of places in your code where these cases can never happen, but you have to write something. Is, in, is there a way to, like, avoid having to spell out these cases in order to allow them? So, in some sense, this is uh, sort of ignoring the case. It's a fairly cheap kind of ignore. Um, there's sort of two maybe easier answers, although I'm not sure if they're easier. One answer is you could, or the reason we're having to spell it out is that the fact that this is an impossible situation is not present in the context where we're redefining this program. You could define the whole thing with dependent types where the precondition for you is available as an argument to your input and you could prove in line the fact that it is impossible and then you could dismiss this case by constructing a proof term of false instead of an actual program. That seems like more work than typing red block zero. The other possibility is you can introduce a special opcode for cannot happen. And then you just, you don't, don't use this opcode. So instead of red block zero, you say cannot happen. And then you just prove that you never execute any cannot happen statement. That seems, you know, slightly easier maybe. You don't have to make up a zero block. Like if I didn't know how to fill it in a some, some kind of block, yeah, maybe this could be easier. But uh, turns out in many cases, this is not a significant practical issue. So we don't really, didn't really bother with either of these <coughs> plans. Make sense? Okay, uh, so here's the implementation of write that we asked you guys to write. Turns out it's actually quite straightforward. All you do is write the value to disk zero, and then you write the value to disk one. Okay, easy enough. We'll look at the proof, and the proof is a little bit more interesting than this. Um, one interesting tidbit I wanna show you guys actually is the initialization code. So when we initialize the disk uh, at first, um, Here's the code that uh, I want you guys to look at here, uh, is um, 
we're actually going to write zeros over the entire disk. So this initialization routine first checks the size of the disks. And if they actually match in size, we're going to write zeros over both of the disks and then return that we're done. If the disks are of different size, we actually fail initialization altogether because we're going to prohibit trying to mirror two disks of different sizes. That's kind of annoying. We could do the min, but we don't bother. Make sense? So one question is, why do we have to write zeros over the disks? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. So, like, yeah, yeah the proof is not going to go through. What would actually go wrong? So, so there's two interpretations of this. One is that our spec is just too conservative, and that's totally fine. Um, the other interpretation is this is actually really important, in the sense that something is going to crash or go wrong if we don't zero the disks. Which is it? Yeah. That's true. So I guess so. the way uh, to think about this is um, the code state tells us what the initial disk state is. And presumably, it just says, you get two disks. They're maybe of different sizes. We check for that. And they have garbage initially. Totally fine. So the real question you have to ask yourself is, what does the sort of spec require for you for the initial disk state? Um, our spec actually says you can get garbage initially. It doesn't actually require that you come up and you have a nice zeroed out mirrored disk. It's totally fine to maybe expose garbage. So we got two disks, same size. They both have some garbage. We'll just expose the garbage to the top level. Is that a good plan, or is it going to fail? Yeah. The garbage isn't going to match between the two disks. Yeah. Can the top level see this? Yeah. Do you initialize by just copying between one? I think that is a fine implementation of initialization. We is this one zeros. I think it's fine to copy the garbage from one to the other. And I think the particular reason why it's actually important to do this is, as you pointed out, the garbage doesn't match. And you can actually observe this if you read the same sector across a disk failure. So suppose we were reading sector 3 before we wrote x to it. So this one had the value 2 in it. And this one had another garbage, you know, 100. So I was reading that sector. I didn't know what to expect. It's garbage. I get 2. Oh, that's cool. All right, that's 2. And now the disk fails. Now my implementation reads the other disk. And now I get 100 back. This is nonsense. Like the disk is changing underneath of me. This is not allowed by the specification at the top level. So th in this case, it turns out that this initialization is really important for avoiding prohibited behaviors at the top level uh, of this uh, abstraction. Make sense? Question. Yeah, so, so, uh, so uh, you could probably write a different specification that has the notion of uh, where, I guess, l let me try to imagine a specification that you're uh, describing. Um, the disk at the top level is kind of a funny disk. It has values that are blocks, but it also has these uninitialized values. And it's like a cock option type. And uninitialized values are weird in the sense that if you read them multiple times, you can get different values out. So it's a totally fine abstraction, if a little bit complicated. Uh, so I think the main reason that we chose not to do that is because it's, you want to hide as many details as possible for the top-level guy to make his life easier. And here, the fact that he always has to consider, is that an uninitialized sector? And if so, you get non-deterministic results. That might make things a little bit uh, annoying for him to deal with. Um, so. You're, you're totally, totally right in terms of the dimensions that we're playing with here and choosing the spec. Um, so it's possible to avoid the need for init by exposing these um, uninitialized values to them. Yep. Make sense? Other questions? OK. So let's look at uh, some proofs of this in the style that I've been drawing on the board using these pre and post conditions and see how they actually uh, work out. So the first thing I want to look at is a proof for the read system, uh, read uh, implementation here. So um, as you can see, the theorem statement that we're looking at is this prog spec statement. And this prog spec statement consists of um, three parts. So there's the precondition, there's a post condition, and then there's a recovery condition. I'll talk about the first two, and Franz is going to talk about the third um, later. Um, so the precondition and post condition are pretty much what I was drawing on the board for you guys. 
So this prog spec statement says that if you start in a state that matches this precondition, we'll decompose this in a second and understand what it's saying in detail, and you run this program, the read A, which we are passing as an argument to prog spec, then when you're done, your state is going to look like this. The disks are actually seem to be the same, and the return value R that the post condition gets as an argument must be what's add on disk at that address. And we use this question mark pipe equals operator <laughs> uh, to uh, make these uh, predicates fairly succinct. So what this operator uh, means from yesterday's lecture is if this thing exists, if it's not none, then it satisfies the predicate on the right side of that operator. So the way to interpret this spec uh, is the precondition is we got our two disks, and for both of them, if they are not none, meaning if they haven't failed yet, then they're equal to some hypothetical disk D. And this is the spec disk that we are imagining. And in the post condition, we're saying the same thing, except that we're also saying that the disk, our spec disk D at address A, if that's a valid value, meaning it's not none, then it's equal to our return value R. That makes sense? Any questions about, yeah? That is correct. The, um, spe what stops both of the disks from being none is, if you recall from uh, uh, last lecture, is the state that we define in the API for this. Uh, let me flip through a different file here. The API uh, says that the, um, yeah, replicated disk API. It should, um, oh, sorry, not replicated disk, the two disk API. Um, the uh, two disk API, the state at the code level is these two disks and this proposition that says you cannot have both of them be none. And we spent uh, maybe more time than <laughs> was worth it to <laughs> explain how to construct these proof expressions. Uh, yeah. Okay, so that's the sort of model, that's the specification we're looking at for the read operation here. And now we're gonna try to prove it in the style that you saw on the board. So let me pop up the proof state at the bottom of the screen here. And now we see that uh, what we have in context is exactly this prog spec statement with the precondition, the post condition, and the recovery condition we'll cover shortly. So the way we're, what we're gonna do is, first of all, we actually have to unfold the definition of read to see the semicolon so that we can decompose things. So we unfold our read and this breaks up the read in the bottom here into first, the read of the first disk, and then some other stuff like we see if the first disk worked or not. And the step tactic is gonna implement the thing I showed to you on the board. It's gonna find something that describes that a prog spec for just the read, and it's gonna plug it in. So where's it gonna find this prog spec for just the read? So we have actually a definition of these in a separate file that we proved. Uh, let's look at what they look like. Um, here is the prog spec for the read of disk zero. So, so it doesn't fit quite on one screen, but uh, here is the prog spec for, let me scroll down, for this read D0A, which is exactly the thing we are seeing at the bottom of the screen. We're about to run that. So here's what you use. Here's the precondition. It must be that the disk is in this kind of a, or your system is in this kind of state where disk zero is equal to some disk D zero, and something is going on with disk one. And the something is going on with disk one, um, this is uh, something you have to sort of plug into the spec. So the precondition takes as an extra argument some hypothetical sort of ghost parameters, if you will. And these parameters allow us to suppose the existence of some specification level state. You'll see the importance of using F instead of saying the other disk is equal to something else uh, in a little bit. But this is the precondition. We're gonna line it up with our precondition in our proof state at the bottom here, which actually looks very similar. So D0 in the precondition for just the read is the D at the bottom of the screen in our full precondition. And the F here, what's going on with disk one, is the EQD in the precondition we're trying to prove. And here's the post condition. It basically says, well, if it's working, you got the right value. And if it's failed, disk zero is now declared to be missing. That's a predicate that basically says false. 
just can't be the case. You can't have a disk in, that, in there. Okay, so let's see how this works. So if we run the step tactic in our proof for the entire read, replicated read implementation, well, we get one sub goal now, uh, and it actually looks kind of like what you expect from what I was drawing on the board. What we are left with is a prog spec about the remaining program, which is the match of the result we got from reading the first disk. And the precondition that we are now left with is actually the post condition of the first read. It actually kind of looks like the, the board diagram there. Okay, and there's some superfluous stuff in the hypotheses that I'll clear out for you guys to make it clean. One interesting sort of aspect of these, this style of proofs is that there's actually never anything interesting in the hypotheses other than some identifiers. Everything of interest is captured in this prog spec statement that you're looking at in the goal. So let's see if we can step again. And the step fails. Um, the error that you get is no matching clauses. So any guesses why we cannot step, we cannot use the same approach in the prog spec goal that we're looking at right now? Yeah, exactly, right. So the only plan we had is for dealing with semicolons. There's no semicolon. There's a match at the top level. We're going to do different things. So indeed, I guess the destruct R gave it away. Um, we have to consider what are all the possible return values we could have gotten from that first read. To struct the R, we get our two sub goals. The first one is when we got an actual return value back, and you can see that now we're proving the correctness about a return value. And let's do step, and it just solves the whole thing. That's a little bit cool, but let's see why that happened. So here's the thing we're trying to prove. The precondition says disk zero is equal to A prime, disk one is equal to A prime, and the value you were getting is the right thing on that disk. And our post condition basically says the same thing, except in a slightly different order. It says the return value is equal to the contents of the disk, disk zero is A prime, and disk one is A prime. So our step tactic internally has an intuition call that can figure out all these things match up, and you don't have to actually do much with it when your precondition is so close to your post condition. So now we can look at the other case where the first disk failed, now we can actually have a program where it's a call to read the second disk. And we're going to use step. You can look at the spec for reading from the second disk. It actually looks almost like reading from the first disk, except they're all flipped. Uh, so disk zero has this hypothetical something is true frame predicate. And disk one is the one that sh better be working in order to read from it. So let's see what happens with step. So the cool thing here, you can almost see uh, why we needed that F thing about other disks. We actually now have a disk zero where we know its uh, state is that it's missing. It's not equal to some disk, it's just gone. So this is the flexibility that we're uh, supporting by allowing different predicates to be true about a disk, both EQ predicates and missing predicates. So when we do this miss, uh, with step call, uh, we basically advance past that uh, read call, and now we're looking at a match, and our precondition now considers the two cases. This is the post condition of that read. It also has the two cases. We can do case analysis on it, destruct one, go into the first case. Now, again, the precondition looks pretty close to what our post condition um, should be. Step solves it. And here's the case where both disks failed. And you can see that our automation basically carried through these two facts and combined them. So reading disk zero told us the first disk is missing, and reading disk one told us the second disk is missing. So that's what in our, what's in our precondition right now. And step is going to solve this, and we're done with the proof. And the reason step solves this is because we proved this one short lemma up top that basically says both disks are not missing. So if you never know that disk zero is missing and disk one is missing, that's just false. And we just give cock this hint for automatic resolution, and that helps our step tactic just dismiss this with no additional effort. Make sense? Any questions about this proof? How this ties together? All right. So um, let me maybe look at uh, one more proof here that's interesting, the, the right. Um, this is that what we're asking you guys to implement. Um, the proof actually looks uh, quite similar to what we just looked at for reads. So hopefully this will go quicker. Um, we unfold the write, and here's an implementation of write. Write to one guy, write to the other, return. 
And we just step through these cases. And uh, the reason we needed a struct is because it might be that the write failed and the post condition doesn't quite match up. So here's uh, what happened. So um, where we are in the proof right now is we did the first write and we're about to do the second write. So the program, as you can see in the state here, is do the second write and then return. So we should be able to call step. And in fact, step succeeds, but it leaves us with this weird goal where it requires that we prove that there exists some A0 and some B0 such that something. That's a bit of a failure of the step tactic. And the reason it failed is not because it didn't see a semicolon, it saw the semicolon. The reason it failed is because it couldn't automatically prove the implication of our precondition to the precondition of the smaller lemma that we invoked. And that's because, let's back up and see why they didn't quite line up. So the reason they didn't line up and we, didn't, we got this messy proof state is because our precondition right now is this match R based on the two cases. And the precondition for the right opcode that we're about to invoke is just disk zero is this and disk one is that. So it's unable to sort of match up this match on one side, the pre, and the much more explicit disk one is this, disk zero is that on the other side. So we need to, again, destruct R, not because this is actually an interesting control flow, but just to destruct the precondition so that it looks down here just like the precondition of the guy we're about to invoke. And then step is actually going to do the right thing and automatically push all this stuff through. And then we can keep going and uh, this sort of proof goes through, as you might imagine. Make sense? Questions about this automation and what's going on? I push this proof. Yeah. What is intuition e auto? Intuition e auto. I'm sure someone else can explain this better than me, but uh, intuition, roughly speaking, breaks up all these ands and ors and probably does other stuff that is not super, super relevant here. And then in all of the sub goals, it runs the e auto tactic. Uh, so you can actually break it down a little bit more. So here we can run intuition, and ah, it turns out that was enough. Ah, I didn't really need the e auto. I sort of gotten used to just typing this blindly. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, probably, maybe that's the case everywhere. Apparently so. Yeah, so I didn't really need the e auto part, but uh, it's kind of helpful if you break up the, your ands and ors, because a lot of my stuff is ands, and then in one of the cases, you need the e auto, slightly more powerful automation tactic to solve it instead of the regular auto and omega that I think it invokes uh, if you specify no argument. Make sense? Okay, any other questions about this automation? Okay, so I'll probably leave it there. Uh, if you guys have more questions about whore logic, uh, you can uh, come up and ask us after the fact, but uh, I'll let Franz uh, talk a little bit more about this recovery condition that we saw and how we deal with crashes in our system. Okay, everybody can hear me? Good. Um, so, um, so, so far, you know, we've been talking sort of about one type uh, of failures, which are basically faults. You know, the disk either stops working, or, you know, the, a sector, you know, stops start working, correct? The previous assignment almost about like one sector stops working, you know, we remap it, and then hopefully, you know, we'll hide the bad sector. Uh, we talked, you know, so far all about a complete disk failing, uh, but we didn't really talk about crashes. And, uh, so the, the crash scenario is what I want to talk about now. And it just uh, you know, may be useful to start off at, a, at the blackboard for a little while, sort of explaining you know, how we think about it and how we model it. Um, so chalk. And, I need to. Um, and I'll start at a very, very basic level. And just you know, go over actually what happens when a computer fails or crashes. Something happens. And that will help us understand, you know, how we can model uh, crashes. 
Uh, so, you know, the scenario that we're basically looking at right, is we have some computer, maybe has a screen, whatever. Here's the processor, the memory, whatever. And, you know, we have a connection to some storage device, you know, that's sitting outside. And that actually keeps our, you know, persistent storage. Or all the pictures that we've drawn, correct, is here's our array of blocks, basically. Right? And so, you know, what happens in a at a crash? Well, step one, uh, and this is almost an assumption. Uh, uh, but so, and you think about a crash as basically the, um, the, 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 uh, as the power goes out, right? like somebody pulls the cable out, right? And so there's basically nothing can be executed. So step one, computer stops. Nothing happens, right? And so this is, a, a, you know, a, a, the formal sort of more precise way of saying is it's a, it's a fail stop model of the world. And so even though, you know, you can imagine different models of the world where, you know, the electric, uh, electricity goes out and the computer scribbles a little bit here and there, uh, and we're usually going to assume that doesn't happen. So Power goes out, computer stops, and this is sort of what you assume, you know, typically uh, you know, today, right? So then the second step happens is, you know, at some point power comes back on. And so we, you know, there's a reboot phase going on, and so the computer powers itself up. Uh, but it doesn't immediately start actually serving requests from users or, you know, processing uh, packets from the network. You know, there's a final, you know, important step, which is you know, the computer actually runs recovery. So before we actually process anything, you know, we get a little bit of a chance, you know, to look at the state on, the, for example, in the persistent storage and maybe fix things up, you know, so that we can actually keep on, uh, so that when once we're fixed up, we can actually start processing uh, requests again. So the last step is we're going to start processing it. And so those are the four, you know, sort of you know, basic, you know, way, uh, steps in any sort of, uh, you know, crash uh, event. Now, it's a little bit more complicated uh, than this because, the, you know, if we think a little bit about recovery, you know, there's sort of some work going to happen during recovery. So the computer's actually running, right? And while recovery's uh, happening or is running, the computer might crash again. You know, maybe power file goes out again, right? And so there's going to be a case where we have to think about, which is like when recovery goes actually straight back to stop, right? And then comes up again and recovery runs again. And maybe it makes it partially through Maybe it makes it fully through. Maybe it doesn't even start. Maybe it crashes immediately again, and recovery starts again, right? And so, in fact, you know, this cycle could be, you know, forever, right? We might, the computer might never, you know, run long enough, or the rec recovery might never run long enough in, in principle, or, you know, potentially, of course, in reality, that almost never happens, but it could happen, right? And, you know, since we're formalizing everything, you know, we need to deal with that particular case, too. All right, so that's the sort of the big, big picture. Um, the next thing I want to do is think a little bit about why actually, or just sort of ask the basic question, like why is actually recovery necessary? You know, why, you know, why couldn't we just start processing packets and maybe do recovery later or on the site, right? And this is actually very similar to, you know, the picture that uh, Nikolai drew uh, for inlization, correct? Uh, in fact, I'm going to reuse this picture and then exactly make the same point. So, you know, the, the, the thing to consider, correct, is uh, we're doing a write operation. And so the system was appropriately initialized. You know, the two disks were completely in sync. You know, they have the same values. Uh, we're doing a write operation. And as you see, uh, as you saw in you know, the assignment and as you see in the, the, the code that we just looked at, you know, the write operation, the top level spec write operation, updates both disks, right? It does a write to the first disk. You know, in our storage, this is D0, this is D1. And it doesn't uh, then write to the second disk, right? But you know, clearly, you know, uh, we need to model the case or handle the case where we're going to actually fail right between, you know, writing D0 and D1, right? And in fact, we get exactly this picture, right? If we initially started out with 100, 100 on the disk because immunization worked properly, but we started doing the write, we wrote the first disk, we wrote two to the first disk, then we crash, right? And so we're now going to go back to our situation here where, you know, we're we're processing, something happened, we go to stop, we reboot, and we get the recovery, right? And so the question is, like, is it important that recovery runs? Or could we just proceed? And just to make you think for a second about this. 
how bad would it be if we just keep running? You sort of like skip the recovery phase and just start processing. You know, so you know the way to think about this, correct? Is that you know you're exactly right. This is almost it's identical to the scenario that Nic uh, Nicolai just sketched out a little bit earlier. Like if we do a read, so we recover, or we reboot, we skip recovery, we start processing. So we start processing reads, for example, and let's say this was like sector, you know, it's block zero, one, two. Uh, we do a read of two, and uh, we do then another read of two. Well, what do we expect these two reads to return? We expect them to return the same value, right? I mean, our spec actually says that we, they're supposed to return the same value. Well, is that the case? Well, that's not really guaranteed, correct, in our particular setup because the first read might actually return the value in D0. So it returns two. We do the second read. Maybe D0 just failed, correct? And we don't do any recovery. So we start reading D1 and boom, we're going to return Right? And our spec, you know, this is a very weird disk, you know, a file system D disk, right? Where you do two reads in a row, and actually do return different values, even though you're reading the same block. And uh, so our spec disallows it. And so we, the, the real conclusion from all this is that, you know, having a fix-up phase during the recovery is actually crucial to maintaining our specs or to be able to implement our specs. Okay? Good. That all makes sense? Um, okay, so now let's think a little bit more. Um, so this is like what actually happens in the real world, right? And now we're sort of faced with this question, how we're going to formalize this, you know, how we're going to you know, code this up in a way that we can actually think about, you know, proving theorems that basically say, well, even uh, if the disk, you know, <laughs> fails, we have a replicated disk, it goes through these phases, it starts processing again, we're guaranteed, correct? You know, we hopefully, you know, when we're done, we can prove that after recovery, and we do two reads, that both reads will actually return, you know, the value two, if that's the, the value that actually is on the disk after recovery, right? We have to be able to prove something like that. So how do we go about it? Well, let's first draw back up our um, simulation uh, diagram and uh, think about how we might model this. And, you know, there's no one single answer, you know, to actually modeling failures or crashes. And, you know, we have a particular way of doing it. And that's the way you're, I guess, going to be suffering through in the, in the assignments. Uh, I think it's a pretty clean one. Um, um, actually, one, I want to make one more. All right, well, I'll make that later. Okay, so back to our sort of standard picture. You know, spec states, you know, there's some transition to another spec state. So this was z S0, we go to S1. Uh, we have code states, right? Uh, and, you know, we're starting out in some code state. And, you know, in the case of the right, you know, we have at least one intermediate state where we you know, say update the second disk or the first disk. And then uh, we do a second write. I guess it's into another state, say, and, um, you know, the general storyline is that we, you know, we have to prove refinement, you know, between, you know, the, or the abstraction function between these two states, correct? Um, but this picture, you know, this is sort of a picture that sort of only argues about correct execution or execution without any crashes, and where, you know, basically we go boom, 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 boom to the end, and we're done, you know, right succeeded, now let's prove it, and we're done. Uh, but we need to extend this picture, correct, to actually allow, you know, for uh, recovery. In fact, to allow for crashes at any particular point in time, right? Because in any phase, you know, we could crash right here. We cra could crash right here. You know, we could crash right here. And so we need to sort of, you know, capture that. And so the way we capture that is that um, in our execution semantics, you know, when we run, you know, when we sort of crank through this, do this symbolic execution, correct, of states, we allow for any, at any point in time uh, to make a transition to the recovery procedure. So we can go to another state from which we start running the recovery procedure. 
Um, and so this is sort of building into the, you know, the way we do this sort of, uh, you know, what we have been calling the sort of symbolic execution of programs. So any program that can run for a little while, but then from any point, from any state, it can actually go to a recovery, you know, state. And from the recovery state, we're going to run the recovery program, correct? The recovery program is going to do a bunch of work. And so it might actually run to some other state. Now, what can happen during recovery? We crash again, right? And we may start running recovery again. And so we need a reason for all those cases, correct? We might have taken one step in recovery, then crash. And so we have to run another possible state, right? Then run recovery or start recovery again. But now, of course, this at this state that we did one step of recovery. So we can't just start out from here. Okay, so we do the same thing here. How about this? You know, maybe two, two steps in recovery. What could happen? Rush. Shit. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Can't you arrange your recovery algorithm so that it's item positive? Uh, this is going to be the next, you know, keep that word in your head. This is exactly the next step. Yeah, we got to do something here, right? We have to have, you know, and we keep going like this. We have an infinite amount of uh, number of executions, and, you know, this is going to give us a lot of trouble, right? So uh, the key thing, as, you know, uh, you point out is that, uh, the property that we're going to exploit and that, you know, any sort of full tolerance system actually exploits um, is that our recovery, well, with the recovery procedure, we're going to put a condition, recovery must be item potent. And uh, let me mean, explain what I mean with item potent here, uh, because actually it's a term that's used widely in computer science with, in di with different meanings. Uh, in the database world, which is where we sort of, or the systems world where item potent is used, it basically means we can re-execute you know, a procedure and it will end up in the same state. And we can re-execute it again and we'll end up in the same state. Right? And so and there's a requirement on the recovery procedure. And it sort of makes sense, correct? Because we're, we're, to assume that you know recovery has, to pr has this property, even forget you know forget verification. Uh, if your s computer crashes, you run the recovery, your computer crashes again, and you run the recovery, you will all hope that you'll end up actually in the same state as ever running a recovery once. Right? And typically, you know, the way that it is in the database literature or the storage literature, this is implemented is using logging or you know transactions. Uh, so we're going to have this requirement that the recovery procedure is going to be item potent. And presumably what we'll have to do, correctly in our story, is that actually we have to prove that the recovery procedure itself is item potent. Okay. Good. So that's the, and that's one way that we're basically going to get rid of all these, uh, uh, we're going to know these infinite executions. Uh, but I have to say a little bit more before I can make that argument. Um, the other thing that we're going to do uh, is, uh, because we want to be able sort of to separate, you know, the, the, the uh, just we find this very convenient, we want to separate the um, reasoning about no failures from the reasoning about failures. Uh, and so the way we're going to do that uh, is we're going to extend our war logic picture that maybe I just erased. <laughs> yes, I did. Um, actually here. Here, the, the line is just, just, just there. Um, we're going to have a pre, a post, a post, and one more uh, condition, what we call the recovery or the crash condition. And that recovery condition um, is going to capture what should be true if uh, the program or the procedure would crash. So somewhere in between, we're running like these two writes. Uh, the recovery condition is going to capture uh, is a predicate that describes the state of the system uh, after a crash and before recovery. And so the picture that we're going to have is the following. Um, when we run a code fragment, you know, there's going to be the post condition, which allows us to sort of transfer to this state using the whole logic thing, or we're going to go to a crash you know, uh, state, and there in that crash state, the recovery condition is true.
Um, and then, uh, and we're going to write that for everything. But the recovery condition is going to be, we're going to try to pick a recovery condition, as you say, that is sort of you know, pretty universal. You know, any state that we might have crash in, we'd like to, to capture that with a sort of single recovery condition. And, uh, and that, and so in fact, if recovery itself crashes, let's go through the crash condition. The recovery function must have a crash condition, like every procedure in our you know, framework has a crash condition. So what would be a good, sensible you know, crash condition for the recovery function? Well, presumably be the same as that universal crash condition that we already have, right? So if recovery every crashes, we're just going to go back to basically, well, we can describe it, it actually stays in the same state with the same crash condition, right? And so this picture changes now. These all go away. And we have basically a crash. Everything good, hopefully goes to a crash condition that we're going to be describing sort of using, using in one predicate. Right? Yeah, go ahead. So this sounds a lot like thread modular reasoning, which hinges on invariance, right? So uh, every atomic, you know, between atomic steps, I may get interrupted. Yeah. But Yes, yeah, so it's the same flavor. Uh, I'm not familiar in any detail with uh, you know, that sort of theory or the, the, the formalization of that, but I think it's exactly the, the, it captures the same idea. All right. Um, okay, good. Yeah. I'm still a little puzzled, but help me put together. Are the, are the recovery conditions like uh, an invariant that's maintained through all of the code of this? Yeah, for every yeah, for typically it's actually the same invariant that's maintained everywhere. Uh, but you know, every procedure could have its own crash condition. Maybe the, the crash conditions may be limited than some other crash conditions. But in the end, there's basically one sort of crash condition. So let me give me an example, which hopefully helps you answer your question, uh, which is what I wanted to do. Which is, let's think about the two disk. You know, what is the crash condition of the two disks, right? Or this particular uh, case. Well, we can write it down. So there's only one case to consider that's actually interesting, right? Which is the write, where you know the write tries to update both disks. Um, and so when we crash during the write, you know, what's the crash? In, what was a good description of what the state of the disks you know, could be at, during uh, after a crash? You know, what are the possible? Well, certainly they could disagree, right? That's one possible outcome. So so D one, D, so we could do an up D of you know, d0 you know, for some address va with a value v, right? And um, the other disk is, you know, this is basically uh, disk 0. And the state of the other disk could be just what it was, d1, right? Any other possibilities? I mean, this is the only place, you know, only, you know, so so think about this, right? The right does, you know, the, this top level right does two disk writes. The power fails, and we're looking now at the disk, you know, like the two disk, and then we have to argue about like what the possible values are that are on the disk. So what are the other possible, or possible states here? Disagree on at most one. Yeah, the disagree at most most one, which we're going to actually exploit actually in this particular case. Any uh, so that's actually a great, you know, thing to think. So there could be only one address A in which they differ. Yeah. So, yeah. Let's talk about that for a second in a little bit, a little while. What actually we do during recovery? But let's first figure out actually what the state could be. Is this the only possible state after a crash? Uh, you could fail an initialization. Right? Okay. Let's ignore initialization for a second. Okay, we're we're going to basically, you know, most of our theorems are deformed. If initialization succeeded, and then you run a program, then something happened. If, if we're enumerating all possibilities, yeah. we could crash after having done both. Of yeah. Very good. Yeah. So that's the other. One I, other presume, I presume we're ignoring the case where we crash before we do the two. Uh, why? Well, because at that point, the you know, data has not been written anywhere and there's still a true, true. Yeah, you and I know that, but um, when we formalize it, you know, we don't know, correct? So in our picture here, remember, you know, our picture that actually, you know, does whatever sort of symbolic execution knows nothing about whether we're actually we're in the middle of the write, you know, before write, after write. In fact, doesn't even know about write. Maybe we're executing reads. Very 
Right, so it doesn't really know. And you know, we want to be systematic, correct? And we want to be able to say, like, it doesn't matter in what state you are, you know, you're going to go to, we would like to have a recovery condition that actually describes it so that we can run recovery in it and then prove that recovery is actually idempotent so that we actually can go back and running well, requests. Well, in that case, we can be before both writes, we can be after one write, we can be after both writes. Yep. So, you know, so there's a D0, D1. Basically, there, you know, D0, there's going to be some top level, you know, our spec disk, correct? So either D1 is equal to our, uh, this should be our spec disk. Sorry, uh, is equal to our spec disk. You know, D zero is equal to our spec disk. That's the case where we crash before you know anything has happened. We can have the case that we one of them is updated, and then we have the case that both of them are updated, right? And actually, slightly more complicated, right? Because any one of them can be missing, right? Because you know, in addition to you know the crashes, you know, it could be the case that just this stopped working. And so it's really you know the way to think about it. There's three maybe holes. Uh, relate, uh, cases where it maybe holds that the first disk has been updated, it maybe holds that both disks, you know, contain, you know, the the more equal to the spec disk, or it maybe holds that uh, both disks are updated. Yeah, questions? The, what I was thinking, we are not considering at all recovery from a crash that's being brought back. Yeah, we're not doing repair, uh, and, and of course, you know, like in a real system, you would do repair, uh, but it requires a little bit more machinery that you know we was too much for three four days to sort of fit it all in. Um, and, and actually, our picture you will see in a second that actually repair would fit in naturally. Yeah, go ahead. Are we relying on the fact that we write disk zero first and only after that to see that right we could affect Ah, you know, it's up to you. You know, so like, what would be the recovery function? Uh, let's think about it. So I think this is a good description of sort of our crash condition, correct? So now we can start thinking about, okay, well, these are all the possible states in which we could crash, and now we need to write a recovery function. And what should be the outcome of the recovery function? I mean, that's a helpful way to think about it. Hmm? Yeah, well, another way of saying this, correct, is we want to be in a place where the two disks are back in sync. You know, they're equal in the same way that initialization sort of put them back into, you know, put them in sync, correct? And recovery must do something similar. And so we have to have a plan, you know, of making that happen. We will we'll have a lemma, correct, that says, like, you know, after two reads and after a couple of writes and you, and you recover and you do a read, you know, you should be able to prove that actually, you know, it didn't matter that the recovery actually happened. You know, so our spec, top level spec, won't be able to prove in that particular case. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so we need to bring them back into sync, correct? And uh, so one way to do that, and, you know, in some ways, you know, we're, the, 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 our write procedure always writes the first one first. Correct? And then writes the second one. And so that means that when we uh, fix things up, uh, we you know probably the best way to do it is actually to, you know, copy whatever was on the D0 disk and put it on D1. You know? uh, in the particular case that we're dealing with, you know, we know there's only one address in which is different. So basically we just have to go for all the disk, all the addresses, read D0, read D1. If, you know, D0 and D1 uh, differ, then we'll copy the value from D1 to D1 from D0 to D1, right? Does that make sense? And once we're done, then basically we're in sort of a nice situation, correct? We're back into sort of a situation. We come back into, so what happens at the end? Correct? Like, so if recovery succeeds, you know, what state are we going to be in? Well, two possibilities, correct? We could either be in S0, the original spec state, or we're, you know, we're going to be in a state that corresponds to the initial spec state because we didn't do any writes, correct? They didn't succeed at all. Or, you know, we succeeded in one write, recovery ran, it copied the disk, you know, the, the second uh, value back to the second disk, and so therefore we're going to be in this second state, namely this, uh, the S1 spec state, uh, or we're going to be in a code state that is equivalent or, you know, related, you know, to the uh, final spec state. Ah, ah, good, 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 good. That's a very good, 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 good question. Um, the, you know, the way to think about it is that um, uh, 
you know, think of it as, as a server that processes request. And so, you know, we got a request. Uh, uh, during the request, we failed. Um, uh, well, the system, the server ran recovery, and it's done. You know, the request, of course, might have gotten no response at all or a failure, and so it's up to the client to figure out what to do. Uh, but if it then sends in now a new request, then we'll start processing it. Uh, but we're in a clean state to accept those requests. No, no, no. You just you could be either one. Correct? You send a write to my server, and the two possible outcomes are the write actually will start from S0. It will start from S0, and it may stay in S0. S1 implies S0. The model is that any request is allowed to be dropped as long as the system tells you that it was dropped. Yeah. It doesn't tell you otherwise. Okay. It's like any web server like on the internet. Like, you send a request to it. Or like you go buy a book at Amazon, you click buy. Are you guaranteed that you will buy? No. No, right? There are two outcomes. Either whatever, you know, your credit card was, you know, uh, uh, you know, deducted and, you know, maybe a book will show up in the mail or nothing happened, right? You know, the credit card was not deducted. Yeah. And that's the two possible outcomes. This is exactly the same situation. I, I, exactly, and you can argue with them afterwards, correct? Yeah, go ahead. I'm still confused uh, by now something that Adam said. Uh, Adam, <laughs> <laughs> quiet. <laughs> uh, you want that not just uh, you continue processing requests, but also that, uh, that the sender of the previous request gets notified that it didn't happen. Ah, but, so that's not what we model. Ah. Uh, if we model, you, what you do know is that if, was, if you made it to S1, so think about this way. If you made it to S1 and the server sent you a response back and you received the response, you know you made it to S1. If you never receive a response, you don't know where you are, either in S1 or S0. And now it's your problem to figure out what to do. And this is, like, this is sort of standard distributed systems, right? You know, the, you know, the, the if, you're, if you're writing an application on top of such a file system and you need atomicity, what you need to do is you need to verify for yourself yeah. in the application so, Okay, so the proof obligation is basically if you fail in the recovery case. Is it, is it that you're going to run the same code starting from S1 as, as you did? No, so basically the we get the next request, and maybe the next request is a read, maybe the next request is a write. You know, so basically think about a procedure. We run one procedure at a time. We're reasoning about the correctness of one procedure at a time. And if a procedure fails, then either it stays in the original state, or it actually makes it you know, to the final state for that particular procedure. OK, but then you said that the, that the code is going to go back to the beginning. So it has to be OK for the code to be running on the bottom left yep. and, the, and the abstract state to be on the top right. Mm -hmm. So we don't actually so formally don't model that. step four in Franz's sort of real world description of what happens on a crash. When the computer finishes recovering, we stop proof obligation. You recovered into S0 and S1, then what you do is up to the application. Yeah. Wouldn't it be a nice thing to specify that the next thing that happens is also uh, double checked and reasoned? Uh, so we, okay, so in this lecture, we're not going to do that, but in our uh, bigger storyline, what we have is, you know, the, uh, after, during the recovery, every layer gets a chance to run. I, I, uh, I, I. So there's an application sitting on top of here, correct? You know, that actually you know, only sees S0 and S1. And that application, when we actually run the recovery, we also actually allow the application to run recovery. And so uh, when the application, uh, so let's say we have a failure in the middle, then the application recovery function will run. The application recovery function can say, like, maybe ask actually the state, or am I in S0 or S1? And then decide to do something, right? So that's how the you know, the different layers, you know, composed together. In the same way as, you know, like in a normal computer system. 
Make sense? Sort of. OK. OK, let's go on. Yeah, maybe we'll. Um, OK. Um, we talked about recovery. Let me actually see where we are. Talking about crash conditions. Uh, we talked about what the recovery procedure should do. Uh, uh, let's talk a little bit before we uh, look at code uh, for a second. Uh, think a little bit about what happens, uh, whether the recovery procedure correct that we're currently imagining to repair things up is that we just go through the, we read both disks, and if we find an address where the two blocks are different, we'll copy the data from the first disk to the second disk. Right? That's our current recovery procedure. And the question that we want to ask, you know, before sort of diving into, you know, the, uh, the proving part, is that recovery procedure idempotent? Yeah, okay, good. So, like, we run recovery, correct? And uh, so, like, this disk is actually gone, D0. Well, what will we read? Well, we'll read D1, right, the old value. Is that okay? Yeah. It is okay, correct? Well, why is that okay? Or to what, you know, states must, you know, D1 correspond to? That's zero. That's zero. Right, so and our recovery procedure says like the post condition is either you end up in S0 or you end up in S1. So that actually case works out. Make sense? But that's a great question, and we'll see it showing up in the recovery procedure in a second. Uh, but like returning to sort of the, uh, the question, this sort of sketch of recovery procedure missing some details. You know, does it, you know, does it feel idempotent? You know, can we run it over and over again? Well, let's consider the two cases, correct? You know, there's the case where, no, we, can't, we got to here and we failed. And so we run recovery again. Perfectly fine, right? There's nothing really, we have not changed anything. We can recover, run recovery over and over. We made it to two and uh, maybe we'll fixed up the disk. You know, actually we wrote, you know, the two here and then we crash. Can we, recon, reco uh, can we run recovery again? Ah, sure. There's no problem at all, correct? Because now the two disks are equal. We'll run for all of them, and nothing actually will change. So that makes sense? So it looks like, you know, the, you know sort of intuitively, uh, you know, depending on exactly, you know, the details of the recovery function, we should be able to run it over, over, and over again. And it always has the same crash condition. Okay, we're ready to look at some specs and code to see actually how this all works out. Okay, so back to, so this is a fragment of code that Nikolai just showed. This is read. This is our write where we've sort of been arguing endlessly what happens, you know, between when we actually crash between these two between the semicolons, correct? Yeah, and now let's look actually what happens during recovery. Like, let, let's look at the code for recovery. Uh, so this is all read, okay. Actually, let's, for, before we do that, let's actually look at the read. Okay, we, re, we looked at the precondition, we looked at the postcondition, and let's look at the recovery condition or you know, the crash condition. Um, so the recovery condition in this particular case uh, just says the two disks are equal. Yeah, is that a reasonable crash condition for read? Yeah? This does sound like a reasonable recovery condition for read, but it sounds like a reasonable recovery condition for everything. Okay, let's look at write. Why, why okay, let's look at write. Let's look at the recovery condition from right, correct? So we looked at the pre and the post condition, and looked at the post condition, you know, it has both disks are updated, or above the, the post condition for right, correct, was both disks are updated. Now let's look at the recovery condition, and you know, there are a couple cases, correct? The recovery condition says we're in some state, and none of the disks actually have been updated, or we're in some state where the first disk has been updated, 
or we're in the state where, you know, or, or the state corresponds to the state where both disks have been updated. Right? That's our crash condition. Does that make sense as a crash condition? Let me hold up for a second. Oh, yeah, Benjamin, yeah, go ahead. So the uh, argument right after right at the bottom of the screen says which recovery we're talking about. So this one says it, we ran the recovery of the layer underneath of us, but we haven't run our own recovery. And I think at the end we'll get to it. There, exactly. Okay, so not at the beginning of the recovery procedure, but at the beginning of the recovery procedure of this layer. Yes, exactly. I'm going to ignore mostly actually this whole stacking uh, issue. Okay, does this make sense correctly? You know, this corresponds to the three cases actually that we just had on the board here, correct? Where, you know, the, they're equal, one is updated, or both are updated, right? And so that's our crash condition. Uh, notice that, you know, one question you can ask, like, why is the crash condition or the recovery condition different than the post condition? Because in some sense, you know, the recovery condition, I mean, the, the, the post condition is a subset, you know, of the, you know, it's a stronger, you know, it's a slightly stronger than the recovery condition, but basically the post condition certainly implies the recovery condition. Yeah. So the recovery condition is an invariant as to all throughout the execution of the operation at each given point? Yeah. Yeah. And, so we, and it's important to separate the two, right? Because if you're writing about correct execution when there are no failures, you would like to have the stronger, you know, guarantees that the post condition can give you, right? Where the post condition says if the write succeeds, both disks are updated. And so if you do a write and then a read, and you, you know, there are no crashes in between, you know, you would like to be able to reason about what the output of the read is, right? And the post condition gives us that, yeah. So in, uh, in this case, you have only, um, I'm looking at the case where the first disk has been updated and the second one is not. Yep. Um, so you don't have the other case where the first is not updated and the, other, and the second one is updated because if the first disk fails, then you stop the computation, is that the case? Uh, the, 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 if, no. if the, uh, it's covered by the last, last key, yeah, the question mark by people exactly. Um, so if the first disk was, de uh, uh, didn't work, right, then the maybe halt relationship is basically that that disk is equal to none. And certainly, you know, that will halt. And then the second disk actually is updated, and that's the case where we cover it. So one, one thing that we like this maybe holds relationship. So let's say we didn't have maybe holds. How many lines of code, you know, how many more ORs are there then? Well, each one of them could fail, and so whatever, so multiply times three, correct? Yeah. Uh, and so that's just painful to deal with, uh, to write those specifications. And so that maybe holds makes it make the specification much more concise. And so it's a little trick. It's not quite multiplied by three. No, it's correct. Exactly. That's exactly right. That's why I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so now we're comfortable with the crash condition for uh, write. Okay, good. Um, okay, let's walk down now. And hopefully we'll get to recovery. Um, okay, so uh, let's first look at the recovery function before I talk about that state. So here's the top level recovery function. Um, it reads, you know, the size of the disk, and it says, please, you know, recover, you know, through the size of the disk. And you know, the reason we want to do that, correct, is because you know, we need to go through every address and check whether we actually need to fix it up. And so the recovery function actually goes through all of them. Uh, and the way, you know, this is mostly cock, you know, the, uh, the way we do it actually, we start from the end of the disk and then go to the beginning. So we start at the highest address and then go down. Um, and, and the main reason to do that, correct, is in any cock thing that, you know, we can actually then sort of do uh, induction or, uh, and, you know, write a fixed point like this where, you know, we look at the address, if we're at zero, we are done. If we're not at zero, then we have to fix up the current address and then fix up the remaining addresses. Right? Okay. Question? Yeah. Um, you have broken the post point back, aren't they? So couldn't you just view a post point that is also in front of the end and destroy it or something? Or was it breaking? 
then you have to do co-induction. Co and yeah. co-induction is painful to do. If you just define a fixed point, you can define fixed points in a co-inductive type, and then you can do regular induction. Which is okay. Um, okay, so so then basically the all interesting stuff happens really in this function, correct? The fix-up function that actually you know takes one address and tries to fix that address uh, up. Uh, and so let's look at that. Uh, and actually, before doing that, uh, we k keep this rec status thing around uh, mostly for convenience to actually you know mark whether we need to continue recovery or we're basically done. Right? And when can we stop doing fixing up things? I think you know you pointed it out earlier. There's only one address that is out of sync, right? So as soon as we fix the one address that is out of sync, we're done, and there's no really need to go further. Uh, clearly, you could write and fix up differently. You could just say like, oh, I'll just keep going. I just copy the whole disk. Who cares? Uh, uh, but we don't do that here. Okay, so let's look at the fix up. Uh, it does a read of the first disk. Uh, it checks if the disk is working, uh, and then if it's working. We're going to read the second disk, and uh, if that disk is working, and if the two values are equal, that means we didn't do anything. You know, basically they're still in good shape, and maybe we're at actually whatever, you know, block one, and you know the blocks are still, you know, the disks are equal because we're actually we're not updating that one, and so we're going to just go proceed. You know, we need to continue. We need to go down until you know we hit that. That we potentially hit that one address that actually we, that was in the middle of an update. Okay. Um, if they're different, though, then just write the value that we read on the first disk, right? Okay, with MV zero, or with V here's V, and we'll write it at basically at that particular address. Right? And and then we're done because there was only on one address that could be out of sync, and so we can just stop. Of course, we have to prove you know, that actually is all true, uh, but you know, that is uh, the, the intention here. Okay? Uh, if both disks are failed, and then we have this one of these other corner cases where you know, we don't really care about it, so we say that repair is done. Okay, good. So that is fix up, that was recover, and that was uh, recover AT, and that's recover. Okay. Um, so let's look. I think the next interesting thing to do is actually look at the spec of the recovery function, right? Because that, you know, we'll, we need to sort of study that a little bit, and uh, that will help us figuring out like what we need to prove about it. Um, so let me. Uh, I'm going to skip all this and let's look actually look at the top level spec before diving down again. So here's the recovery spec, and in this case, actually, it's not with the function itself, with the theorem, but it's just purely the spec itself. Um, and actually, it is helpful in, in all our theorems. Actually, it turns out to be helpful to, well, let me say that, to uh, keep, a uh, keep track of where we are you know, during recovery. And so we have an inductive type that we call disk status. And basically, the disk can be in two cases. You know, it's fully synced or it's out of sync. And if it's out of sync, there's one address where it's out of sync. And so, uh, so when we start the recovery, you know, that's sort of a succinct way of describing the state of the disk when uh, we're starting. Uh, and so that allows us to write the following specs. So here's our recovery spec again. Uh, well, the precondition um, is for recovery is pretty straightforward. The two disks are completely in sync. You know, for example, we did a read operation. We crashed during the read. There's actually nothing to be done. The disks are still completely in sync. The other case is that you know, we are in a write, and uh, we did a write, and so the disks are out of sync. So we come up, uh, and the two disks are out of sync, and they're out of sync in one address. And that address has to be smaller than the size of the disk. Like otherwise, nothing that we can really prove about it. OK, good. So now we're going to think about the post condition of recovery. Okay? And the post condition of recovery is the condition if recovery succeeds. You know, so we're able, no crashes, or like maybe we failed a couple times, but in the end, you know, we finally made it to recovery. Right? So, uh, so that's the, that statement. And um, we can look at the, what is. Well, if the original disk was fully synced, then there's likely nothing to do. And certainly, you know, that, that's going to be true in the post condition that in the new state, after recovery, the disks are actually in fully uh, synced. If the original disk was out of sync, you know, the first starting state was out of sync, after recovery, there's only two cases left. Right? Where the 
the two disks are equal to the disk before we started writing our, the spec disk before we started to write the, run the operation, or the two disks are equal to both disks being updated, right? And so which is the one case that we now excluded? There's only one case, correct, that sort of we got removed here. They're not the same. They're not the same. The one, like the first disk had the update, but not the second one, right? Okay, good. So recovery course can fail too, so it must have a recovery condition. And let's look at the recovery condition. So here's the recovery condition. And it's basically almost identical, correct, again, to the post condition, except there's one more case. And what is that one more case? Well, the disks are out of sync, right? And that just completely makes sense. And that is our generic crash condition, right? Okay, now let's look at, uh, the one thing to actually look a little bit at is, um, what does it mean for a procedure to be idempotent? You know, what should be true you know, about the recovery condition that will allow us you know, to run recovery again? Uh, maybe I can, ah, well, I'm not as tall as I guess as Nikolai, but you know, that, that, <laughs> that, 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 that picture is important. <laughs> Yeah, so the crash condition or the recovery condition must apply the precondition, right? Because otherwise we can't run, uh, it would be not sensible to run recovery again. And so does it. Yes, it does. Right? So in fact, you know, we almost all, as you see, if you look at the crash condition, there's a good point to make. If you look at this crash condition for recover, it's actually identical to the crash condition for write. Um, and the crash condition for read was simpler, right? But, you know, the, it certainly has to, yeah. Just as a technical note, since we're reusing this in multiple places, it might be useful to be able to define it only once in order to, uh, in, in, order sure. to in order to avoid potential copy yep. and paste errors. Yep. Yeah, we did that actually in this spec, but not in some of the other specs. Yeah, perfectly fine. So it does, correct? I mean, the, if you look at this recovery condition, you know, like it applies, you know, the precondition because the precondition is either the two disks are equal, uh, which is, you know, the two, you know, the before case recovery or the after, and the case in the middle, right? That is when one disk is, uh, one, they're out of sync, that's a disk in a particular case, okay? So the post condition actually implies, or the recovery condition implies the precondition, which may probably means that we can ch chunk this thing over and over. And the only way to think about it is the recovery condition is like a loop invariant. You know, allows us to run recovery over and over and over. That's another way to think about it. Yep. Oh, one part of this that might be a little confusing is that when you do this implication, you're allowed to switch D to a yeah. new value. Yeah, that's exactly. What you decide happening. Yeah. And S. Yeah, so the both D and S are existentials, two existentials that you get to play with. Correct, so for example, if you crash with both disks updated, uh, but they're all both updated to the same well value, you know, you're at the next run of recovery, you know, in the precondition, you're basically in the fully synced state for state prime with the two disks being equal. Okay. Yep, Venture. So I think I now understand why uh, the answer to what you said before, I wanted to try it out on you. Um, <laughs> so at the end of the well, you're Maybe you're going to try it on an atom. No, sorry. <laughs> So this is like the application could have that plan, correct? And so, yeah, and this is exactly what I, I uh, so the key is the, is the best. So the application has its own recovery thing, correct? Sorry, yeah, go ahead. The fact that that information is there and useful can be part of the post condition of the recovery procedure. It, it can be part of the state of S1 or the, the higher level state, the, 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 the top level, you know, this layer has some state and in that state, there, there, there could be a field saying like, I was in the middle of an operation or I started an operation, correct? That when the application comes back up 
and runs its recovery procedure and can look and say, oh, I was in the middle. And then it can do its own recovery and then keep going. So the fact that that information is good. Yeah, has to, absolutely. And presumably that's going to come out of our abstraction relation, correct? Because the, the, the code, this state must have an uh, abstraction relation with, you know, the spec state. But when we're in that state, we're in the, we're in the recovery state. The recovery state is going to get us to one of these, correct? Or, no, sorry. The recovery state is going to get us to some code state that is going to score to one of these two, and we have to prove that. Except for the recovery itself, it actually goes in. Well, okay, but, but we know what it means for recovery. Yeah, yeah, this is, yeah. Because you know, I didn't draw the post condition of recovery, right? The post condition of recovery is, you know, some state that actually corresponds to this one or that one. Yeah. Sorry, I'm getting confused by the last thing you said. Okay. So, so there's just one recovery procedure. Here, here on the board is a, is a picture of. One recovery procedure, absolutely. Exactly. So, but there's only one recovery procedure. Yep. Right? Not one per, um, per operation. In, in the so when we recover, we don't know that we're in the post condition of the right procedure or something like that. We just know that we're in a, we're in a recovered state. Yep. So except, you know, the application. We're in a, then we're in state S1. Yep. The application could do its own thing, correct? We, we know, that, we know that, that we're in some state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily the post condition of the recovery. That's correct. Of anything else. And, and what's crucial is that in the post condition of the recovery uh, procedure is uh, enough information uh, to tell us where we should start again with, uh, with running code. Yeah, if the application wants to do that. Right? I mean, this is up to the application to decide you know, what you know, the thing. Maybe the application doesn't care at all. Maybe all the operations of the application are item potent by themselves. And so the application just does the same thing again. Who cares? Think about this. Your, fi your file system crashes, your file system comes back up. And, and you were running an application on top of the file system. Well, if you're a user of the file system, you, know, you look maybe, oh, my, is my file still there? And if my file is still there, it was great. I'm going to keep working with it. Right? Or maybe you, know, you open VI or Emacs and says, like, oh, you have a crashed version of your file. You should recover that file first before you continue. Right? And um, it's up to the application to leave enough you know, information in whatever one of its these states to figure out what to do, right? And the way typically this happens, correct, is like, in a, again, think about the file system case. You know, you open VI. VI actually doesn't really open the file immediately. It actually goes look around. It's just like, oh, maybe there's a, you know, uh, a pound file uh, in temp that actually should recover. My confusion was it sounded like you were talking about uh, the, the application developer should think about maybe I'm in the post condition. Maybe what I have is the post condition of the right operation that I was in the middle of when we recovered. Mm -hmm. And that's not true. That's gone. Mm -hmm. we're, what we're in is the post condition of the recovery. Yeah, exactly. We're in the post condition of the recovery. And this is why we separate the post, uh, the, the, the post condition and the recovery conditions. Yeah? So if the, the top level client calls the right and then the crash happens, how does, the, how does he know whether the right succeeded or not? He doesn't. Unless you know he has you know, an, an other higher level plan to uh, deal with this case, correct? And so the here's a higher level plan. Right? Like you're running a database, you keep a log, and you know before actually you update the real data, you first to get in the log, and then uh, when you sort of commit, you actually update the real data. So you keep two copies. So does he have to read afterward to see whether? And then he has to read the log, and we'll talk about this on Friday a little bit more. You know, we'll talk about how you implement logging systems. This is exactly the problem that logging systems implement, uh, solve. And so you would implement that on top of it, and it presumably, you know, you should be able to prove, you know, with all the machinery that we just had, that actually this is all okay. And we'll talk about this on tomorrow. Seems kind of bad though that if you ask it to do it right, then it says, well, I might write or I might not write. Well, this, this, this is the world. This is how world works. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you start a write and I'll quickly take your laptop away and then ask you, you know, did the write happen or not? <laughs> yeah. just like does, you cannot get an answer to that question. Yeah? So, so it sounds like there's a, something always true that is the precondition on H0 always implies post-condition on H1 because there's a, always an identity. This post-condition can always be an identity. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. 
there was another question there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that actually might be. If the, in, in reality, I actually, that's actually a good point to, to make. That we, uh, uh, we recall the recovery function of the application after the recovery for, uh, this recovery has happened, and uh, it's up to then the application to decide. But I think the one way to think about it is that you know you're either in S1 or S0, and you start running a recovery. Yeah, so basically, okay, we're going to come out of this here, correct, in some way, and we're going to end up in some state in, on the code level. And that state, we have to prove that it either corresponds to this or it corresponds to that. And that's the two legal outcomes. And this is our post-recovery condition. And so what we do typically, correct, is we take a function that has some crash condition, we compose it with recovery, you know, so we run the function, then we run the recovery, and that will prove that one of these two must hold. Yeah? What happens with the read and then with the uh, basically the same thing. Read. You know, let's say we start read here, and we crash. So before read happens. Well, you know, we'll come back up. We'll run the recovery function. The recovery function will go over all the disks, right? And we'll find out that it's identical. And read has, as post condition actually, that S0 or S1 is equal to S0 in the thing. And, and we're going to be able to prove, correct, after the recovery function, that actually it corresponds indeed, you know, to the original state because nothing is modified. What about the return value? Are you going to ah, so when you crash, there's no return value. Okay, correct? So the, the, you crash, program stops, you know, like your computer. Nothing happens anymore, nothing is returned. And you know, this is like what is the stop model. Then you run recovery, and if you want to do another read, you can go ahead and now do another read. But you know the read just doesn't return anything. Yeah, you can think about it as aborting. You know, I think think about the real world. You know what would happen if you did a read and you. <laughs> so one generalization of some of the last few comments and questions is it is not correct to think of the goal here is we're going to take a semantic that doesn't have failures and we're going to show how to implement that with failures. You yeah. have to change the semantics to support failures. Yeah. Hopefully. Keep it as comprehensible as possible. Namely, everything happened and nothing happened. Okay, so um, so that was the recovery spec. Uh, in fact, uh, let me actually. This is actually a great place to stop. Uh, you know, we're going to ask you to. Uh, well, as part of the homework, and I don't know how many people have been able to keep up with the homework so far or the assignments. A few. Okay, well, um, actually pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I hope you know, all of you, you know, keep working on it and are now excited about crashes because, you know, they're exciting. Uh, that's the real world. Um, uh, but we're going to, what we're going to do tomorrow, let me, uh, so we'll, we'll revisit this tomorrow and then come back and actually, you know, we ask you to prove recovery and uh, particularly what we're going to ask you to do is actually prove that the recovery function is idempotent. Uh, because that is you know, crucial to our, you know, uh, to, to the, this, this plan, correct? And so we have to prove that, frame, that the fix up function uh, is idempotent. Uh, and we ask you to do that as an assignment. You know, I don't expect actually many people to uh, be able to finish that, or, uh, but it is like a nice challenge exercise. Uh, and maybe for even later, but what we'll do then tomorrow is come back and actually look actually how that actually idempotence is formulated and uh, how we can reason that a particular procedure is idempotent. Because I think I'm running out of time here. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah.